Um, okay, let's check this out, and I'm gonna keep going through the LEGO Titanic. Buckle up, here we go, we're gonna see what this is like. Because I was a sheltered kid growing up, I didn't get to see or play any of these games. Um, in fact, anytime Harry Potter came up in conversation, it was considered satanic. No, I'm not joking. So, I have not seen any of this stuff. Um, I was not allowed to look at it, was not allowed to talk about it. If we had friends that were really into Harry Potter, we had to stop hanging out with those friends. So this is all new to me. I have not seen any of this and I'm relatively interested. So if you have any fun stories playing these older games, if you remember them, if they're a throwback, let me know in the comments. I'm interested in your insights, okay? Because like I said, I've never, I've never seen it. More than 30 Harry Potter video game titles across PC, handhelds, home console. Oh, dude, look at that. EA made it? Of course they did. ...and mobile devices. There have been major partnerships with key companies like Lego, experimental titles using the Xbox Connect and PlayStation Move, and of course, they are the mainline titles that coincided with each new movie release. People of the internet, Retro Reconteur here. I'm just a dad who loves games and the stories they tell, and this is the complete history of the Harry Potter video games. The choices you make now will define the legacy of Hogwarts. Even that little bit of the trailer they showed just there looks way worse than the one they released recently. This video is like a year old, so that must be an old clip. And just so you guys know, move stuff out of the way. This is what we're on. So this first bit we're going to be building right here. And then the back of the ship, the stern, is what we're going to be taking on after that. So we have seven bags for this first bit, and then we have nine bags for the last bit. But when it's all done, we will have the full ship completed. With two bags to complete the finishing touches to tie it all together. So, buckle up. We're probably not finishing this today. I think this is probably going to go through next Wednesday. Uh, this has taken us like three weeks to build. It's been a bit of a process, but here we go. Um, I'm also going to set up our Lego cam so you can see what I'm working on as I do it. Voila. It's also the uh, the the uh, cleavage cam, the CC. Did you know that's what CCTV stands for? Cleavage cam TV, yeah. This is our CCTV uh, feed right there. Still think you should get all Jack and Rose minifigures sticking on the battleship. I think we should, yeah. No, I, I think so too. They'd have to be like the mini minifigures, like the ones in the back of the Hogwarts castle um, to be like proportional, but I totally agree we should do that. I think that'd be super, super funny. Um, what's the longest, hardest Lego build we've worked on? This one's long and this one's a lot, but the Lego Coliseum is worse. It's less pieces than this. I think it's like 7,000 or 8,000 pieces. But it is extremely tedious because all of the pieces look the same. And you end up basically just building the same part like 15 times. And then it like goes all the way around the, the circumference of the building. So it's, it's just a lot of doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, which makes it really, really tedious. Whereas at least with the, the Lego Titanic, it's pretty varied. Like there's a lot of different things. You have to build the hole differently depending on where on the ship you are because different rooms were in different places. But as for like the Lego Coliseum, it's tough. That one's tough. Etsy might have some. Yeah, I'll have to check it. Oh yeah, Rocky, of course I love you. Of course. I love you so much. I love Rocky so much. <laughs> Um, Legos are very expensive. Oh, dude, Lego, that, that as a company, Lego has just been cranking the prices. Uh, but they, like part of it is that they realized that adults who have expendable income will buy the really fancy sets. So they started building those out and people like me love them because I like Legos, but I'm not going to pay a hundred bucks for like a hundred piece set, a tiny little thing. But if it's a huge set, that takes a lot of work and is really satisfying to put together, then I'm willing to pay more for that. But I'm not going to do like, I think the value proposition for a lot of Lego sets is like ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. And then it gets a little less ridiculous. It's still very expensive, but it's less ridiculous. 
Whereas like for anything under 200, I think you're, you're kind of burning a lot of extra cash because they just fill like the, the sets aren't very big. They're not that complicated. They're really easy to put together. Yeah. It's just kind of, kind of a, a underwhelming bummer. Many think of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone as being the first HP video game. However, that title actually belongs to Lego creator Harry Potter. Oh, dude, that looks awesome. I loved these old Lego games. We were allowed to play those, like Lego Island. We played that one. I never played the Harry Potter one. But these old school, like late 90s, early 2000s Lego games, dude, those were built different. The game was developed for PC by Superscape and published by LEGO Software in 2001. Being a LEGO game, it's no surprise it focused heavily on building and player creation. It contained four different worlds, including Diagon Alley, King's Cross Station, the Hogwarts grounds, and Hogwarts itself. The characters were modeled after LEGO's Harry Potter sets at the time, which have Dude, certainly seen some changes over the look years. Look at that. As far as how the game actually played, the animation was stiff and a bit wonky at times. But it's easy to see how kids who love Lego and Harry Potter would be intrigued by the game. When it comes to the actual release date, information available online today is surprisingly inconclusive. I found dates ranging from March 21st to October 26th. Look at that frame rate, though. 2001. All of them do seem to agree, however, that it was not only the first Harry Potter video game released, but also the first licensed Lego video game ever released as well. Now, there had been Lego games before, but this marked the first time Lego worked with a third party franchise. Seeing just how much Lego's video. It's like they couldn't afford the extra triangles to make the geometry of the Lego sets reflected with the little circle dots, so they had to put them in textures instead of actually putting it on there. That's hilarious. Game business has grown today, makes it quite a fascinating footnote to history that it all started with Harry Potter. Super, I think Malfoy is beginning to regret his naughtiness now. Just once more. 2001 was a huge turning point for the Harry Potter franchise as the first film was released to the world along with a video game. The video game launched on the PC, Sony PlayStation, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance in November of 2001. Look at those glasses. Those look like weird 3D glasses. That's that's so funny. And I find it I always find it interesting going back to these older games cuz you see how they had to save memory and save on like how their triangle counts and different things. And so like for the glasses, they couldn't do the little bitty cutouts for them because that would have been too fine a detail to put in so instead they just did this kind of rectangle over his eyes and then they tried to i guess make it translucent in the spots where it wasn't supposed to be but it just didn't look right so it looks like he's wearing a yellow visor you know like one of those really weird like gucci sunglasses <laughs> but I mean, it's it's not the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen but it's it's certainly a look Philosopher's Stone is the game many fans think of when remembering the origins of the Harry Potter series in video games. One of the most interesting notes about the first game is just how different the versions were. The PC game was developed by No Wonder, while Argonaut Games handled the PlayStation version. Aside from technical aspects such as resolution and frame rate, modern gamers would probably find it bizarre for a single title to play so differently across platforms. But not only did these titles play differently, they were built completely differently as well. The PC version put players in control of Harry after his arrival at Hogwarts. The game used a third-person perspective and had players learning new spells by attending classes and solving simple puzzles throughout the castle. Despite Hogwarts being somewhat open for exploration, the missions were fairly straightforward and linear. Spells in the game included Flipendo, the video game version of the Knockback Jinx, along with Alohomora, Wingardium Leviosa, Lumos, and Incendio. The spells were contextual, and while they could be cast at any time by the player, they would only react to specific objects in the game. Most of the spells behaved as you would expect, with the exception of Lumos, which revealed hidden platforms rather than acting as a charm to light a wizard's wand like we see in the books and movies. 
The PlayStation version was also third-person, but the story did not follow the same order as the PC version. There were also different gameplay elements and scenes that weren't featured in the PC game. Sure, there were plenty of similarities, including the fact that both games managed to include Quidditch and Wizard cards as collectibles. As for the handheld versions, even though the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance games were both developed by Kryptonite Games, they too played rather differently. The Game Boy Color title was an RPG and seemingly inspired by games like Pokemon and Final Fantasy. The GBA version was a top-down puzzle game instead. Overall, the games received fairly middling review scores, although there was a clear nod to the Game Boy Color version being the best, at least in the eyes of video game journalists. Given the popularity of the series as a whole, though, it's no surprise the game sold well. Philosopher's Stone was the top-selling PC game in the month of December 2001. In February of 2002, the NPD group listed it as the third highest-selling PC game of the previous year with more than 800,000 copies sold. This was despite the fact that it didn't release until November. The game would go on to sell well above 1 million copies for PC. The PlayStation version was even better, with absolutely massive sales numbers of more than 8 million copies Look at sold, that. which actually make it the sixth best-selling PlayStation title of all time. I was unable to find sales numbers for the Game Boy Color version, but the GBA version did quite well, selling just shy of 700,000 copies by August of 2006. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets released in November of 2002 once again alongside the film and once again with multiple versions. No Wonder was back for the PC version, although this time they would also release for Mac as well. Argonaut Games tackled the PS1 version, EA UK worked on the PS2, GameCube, and Xbox versions, Eurocom developed a version for Game Boy Advance, which left Kryptonite with just the Game Boy Color version this go-round. That's right, five different versions of the game, and honestly, even the GameCube, Xbox, and PS2 versions had a few differences between them as well. For starters, the GameCube version was the only one to support a special feature that allowed players to access a secret room if they connected to the Game Boy Advance version using a GameCube GBA link cable. And despite more technical power in the GameCube and Xbox, neither of those versions permitted players to roam freely across the grounds and to land anywhere using the free flight mode which was possible on the PS2 version. Other than that, these console versions were very similar. In Can you imagine if it was like that today, where you just randomly can't go to places? Oh, I where did you play uh, Hogwarts Legacy? Oh, I played it on the Xbox. Oh, so you didn't get to go to Diagon Alley? Oh, no, no, I didn't. Oh, that's a bummer. Should have bought it for PlayStation. Can you just imagine if that was a thing? People would lose their freaking minds can't even oh dude it'd be insane uh respawn is making an fps star wars game yeah haven't heard like anything about it but yeah um lucky trapped all right y'all have a great rest of your morning day or night got a dip for the day peace good to see you my friend appreciate you thanks for coming by what i never got about harry potter is what would it matter if voldemort won um the whole thing is like he would basically install himself as emperor. They'd use the dark magic, blah, blah, blah. Like it would turn into a, a dictatorship basically where he and all of the other death eaters are in control. And that probably would not be too great. Yeah. The other thing he also really hated mixed bloods and mud bloods. So anybody who like mixed the blood of a wizard with muggle blood would probably be executed and stuff like that old hierarchy and tier system of those uh, the muggles and then the wizarding world would take over so i can kind of get it featured a hogwarts castle that provided a little more freedom than the pc game wizard cards also made a return as did birdie bot every flavor beans here they also introduced a lost items bulletin board which was found in the gryffindor common room these items were hidden in various locations throughout the school and along the Hogwarts grounds. For each item found, players were rewarded with a famous witch or wizard card. The PC version was a direct sequel to No Wonder's version of Philosopher's Stone. The graphic style and character models were mostly the same, although there was a definite improvement to the way the game controlled on mouse and keyboard. Some spells learned in the first game were retained, but players took classes to learn new spells as well. The puzzles and overall flow of the game were also improved compared to the first, yet it once again played out very differently than the console versions. Argonaut's version for PlayStation can be looked at as a direct sequel to the Philosopher's Stone version of the game that they made for PS1. 
Some areas of Hogwarts were expanded upon from the first game or moved slightly, although the models and graphics were mostly the same. They did introduce some new minigames and other slight gameplay improvements. Grip Tonight once again went with an RPG style for the Game Boy Color version, while Eurocom made an adventure style, puzzle driven game for GBA. Critics appeared marginally more pleased with Chamber of Secrets when compared to Philosopher's Stone, but not by much. Most publications scored the GameCube and Xbox version slightly higher than the PS2 version, but this wasn't true across the board. It's also important to keep in mind there weren't nearly as many game reviews posted then as there are today. To put it into perspective, Metacritic only has 8 scores for the PC version and only 16 for the PS2 version. Compare that to a recently released modern third-party title like Deathloop, for example, and you'll see that the PS5 version has more than 100 critical reviews at the time of this recording. Sales for Chamber of Secrets were incredibly Still over, over, uh, hyped. Deathloop sucks. <laughs> um, Imperium, I sent you something in Discord if you want to watch it after this video. It is Harry Potter related. Okay. Yeah, if we have time. Uh, I'm totally down. I told Nikki I would wrap this up, or this stream up a little bit earlier than normal, but I did say that on, like, Wednesday or Monday, and I think we ended up going the full length, so we'll see if I actually end up doing that. But, yes, uh, thank you. We, and if we don't get to it today, we can loop back to it next week. That's fine. Really strong yet again. In fact, when all of the versions are combined, the News & Observer reports more than 9 million copies were sold. LEGO would also release LEGO Creator Harry Potter and the Chamber oh, of Secrets wow. in 2002. Although a sequel to the first LEGO Creator Harry Potter game, this one wasn't developed by Superscape. Cube Software worked on the project, and it was published by EA and LEGO Interactive. The sequel built upon the first game by including more models, worlds, and minifigures. With no Harry Potter film scheduled for release in 2003, that presented a unique opportunity for WB and EA that holiday season. Rather Dude, LEGO had a unique talent for making some freaking ugly games early on. Like, wow. That's unreal. Looks as good as a new Pokemon game. <laughs> Rather than uh, releasing a bad. title based That's on bad. a book for a not yet released movie, they instead opted to release a spin off game in the form of Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup. Quidditch World Cup was a deep dive into a fan favorite pastime of the Wizarding World. Even though there weren't any new movies that year, the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire book released just a few years prior in the year 2000. Of course, one of the standout scenes and world-building moments of this installment in the series was Harry attending the Quidditch World Cup. The game started out simple enough with players choosing one of the four Hogwarts house teams and learning through a series of exhibition matches, challenges, and ultimately playing in the Hogwarts Quidditch Cup against the other house teams. Quidditch World Cup did a fantastic job with the small details like including actual names of players and students fans would recognize from the books. After winning the Hogwarts Cup, players unlocked the World Cup and that's where things really got interesting. England, the United States, Japan, Germany, France, Australia, the Nordic team, Spain, and Bulgaria were all available, although Bulgaria had to be unlocked. In an interesting design choice, both the Hogwarts Cup and the World Cup are actually determined by points and not wins. This meant that the team with the highest point total after all games were played is actually the team that would be crowned champion, which may not necessarily be the team with the most wins. Even though the gameplay was a radical departure from previous- It's like the Electoral College. <laughs> oh, politics. Oh. <laughs> Oh God! As Harry Potter video games, critical reception was mostly the same, with reviews averaging around 70%. The PC, GameCube, Xbox, and PS2 versions were developed by EA UK. However, there was also a GBA version developed by Magic Pockets that, unsurprisingly, wow. played quite a bit differently. This version didn't review nearly as well, though, as the full-fledged console versions. With the incredible sales numbers of the original release of Philosopher's Stone, it's no surprise WB attempted to capitalize on the success for a new generation of systems. In December 2003, developer Warthog Games would release yet another version of Philosopher's Stone, but this time for Sony's PlayStation 2, Nintendo's GameCube, and Microsoft's Xbox. This version reused many of the assets from 2002's console version of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and the gameplay is similar. Yet again, though, it proved to be quite a different experience from the PC and PS1 version. Oh yeah, you remember when games used to just leave the button prompts on, on screen? They would just leave it there for like 
20 hours of gameplay. <laughs> like, I hope they won't notice. They'll get used to it. Now, like, it's considered cool. I just have bags of Legos all around. Now it's considered, like, hype and cool to make your screen, like, really minimalistic. Don't show anything if you can help it. But back in the day, man, they used to just... Yeah, we'll just put up all of the button prompts. AC1, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many versions of Philosopher's Stone are there? Many. I miss those old quirks. It, I mean, it's quirky. It's quirky. Versions that came before. This remake had a story that followed the film much more closely, but reviewed slightly lower than the Philosopher's Stone versions that preceded it. In the summer of 2004, it was back to a traditional release, with Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban hitting theaters and yet another movie tie-in game to release alongside. Yeah, the PS2 version looks way better. Look at that. No wonder made the piece. But what the hell is with Ron's face? Look at that. Bottom right. Oof. Oh, man. That's, that's rough. That's bad. Puberty? Yeah, it hits us all pretty hard. PC version, Grip Tonight, the Game Boy Advance. At least it's not doing the thing like some of these RPGs will do when you're playing as characters, like isometric RPG, RPGs will they'll show the picture of the character, but it's it'll be animated, so they'll be like moving, and as you're fighting, they go, rah, 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 as like their face is inside the UI. So this, I guess, is still better, but... Ooh. Version and e Just... I can do the face too. EA UK for the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox versions. All versions were natural progressions based on the games that came before. However, they all had a fairly big shift by featuring the trio of Harry, Ron, and Hermione more prominently than in previous Hermione. games. Hermione! In fact, all three were playable characters for the first time, and the console versions even let you switch between the three at will for most sections of the game. There are spells that are unique to certain members of the trio, which come into play when solving puzzles or trying to progress through certain levels. There are also some bizarre design decisions for the console version, such as the fact that Harry is the only character who can jump across chasms. Like the Chamber of Secrets console game before it, there were also moments where players needed to summon Hedwig for assistance. Both versions also have sequences where the player can ride Buckbeak the Hippogriff. The PC version remained more focused on puzzles, whereas the console versions continued to be more of a third-person action-adventure game with puzzle elements sprinkled throughout. Birdie Bot Beans returned and were once again used to buy items from Fred and George. Wizard cards, chocolate frogs, cauldron cakes, dung bombs, and several other items returned from previous games as well. As for the GBA version, it was once again a traditional role-playing game. It did differ from the GBA games before it by opting for turn-based combat rather than the real-time combat that. of the previous GBA games. Although the Game Boy Color games before it did feature turn-based battles. Critical reviews of both versions once again hovered in that 70% range with the PS2 version. I think Lockie is building, like, he got blocks for Christmas and we haven't really played with him. But we took him out yesterday and I think he's right above me in, like, the living room playing with the blocks. Because I he keep hearing, like, a bunch of stuff get knocked over and... <laughs> so I, I think he's playing with blocks up there. That's pretty cute. I guess it's kind of exciting to see a new Harry Potter game confer or can are coming the original ps1 game came out when i was at school still only like 25 years ago yeah and this is the first one that people are like really really hyped about in a very long time this game's knights in the stealth section gave me nightmares as a child oh really i wonder if he's gonna show it or he might have already because that message is older i don't know version scoring the best the pc version came in at 67 percent Despite the completely different gameplay, the GBA version was also met with middling review scores in the 70% range. Commercially, the games were another huge success, even selling 316,000 copies in the launch month alone. 2004 would also see the release of the first ever Harry Potter mobile game, which was titled Harry Potter oh, Fallen no. Scabbers. The gameplay was rather simple, as players would search for Scabbers as he makes his way through an oh, assortment wow. of different mazes. Unfortunately, this game was not well received. IGN's review of the game said, quote, Harry Potter finds Scabbers isn't much fun to begin with, but when you consider the richness of the source material, the game becomes disheartening and disappointing, close quote. Despite the poor first attempt, it certainly wouldn't be the last Harry Potter mobile game. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire released in 2005 and saw quite a few changes compared to the previous core games in the series. For starters, No Wonder was no longer in the picture and did not develop a PC version. 
Instead, the PC version was developed by EA UK, and it was largely the same as the PS2, GameCube, and Xbox versions. The team-based mechanic of Prisoner of Azkaban was carried over here and expanded upon. The graphics started to shift even more to make the characters look like their movie counterparts. Perhaps the most disappointing change with Goblet of Fire is how it completely did away with the more free-roaming gameplay found in the first three games. Instead, it was more action-focused and broken up into different levels as players competed in the Triwizard Tournament, in addition to a handful of other scenes found in the books and movies. And possibly as a result of these changes, players no longer controlled the game's camera. In fact, the PC version was controlled entirely by the keyboard, with no mouse input at all. On the more positive side, Goblet of Fire brought multiplayer co-op support to the series for the first time. This meant you could have friends take on the role of Ron. What is he collecting there as he flies? Are those beans? They look like beans. Magical beans? Playing alone, most levels gave players the option to pick one of the three main characters, with the exception being levels that involved one of the Triwizard tasks. I, I can't get over Magic dud Pockets blood. developed the game for the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS, while EA Fusion UK handled the PSP version. The GBA and DS versions were fairly similar, but neither were an RPG as had been the custom for it. Oh yeah, the DS games when they just had two screens and they didn't know what to do with it. So they were like, eh, we'll put uh, some UI there, I guess, maybe, I guess. One of the handheld versions in the past. The PSP version was also its own thing. However, it tried to be closer to the home console versions than its Nintendo handheld counterparts. Even with these changes, critical reception for Goblet of Fire was mostly the same as previous games in the mainline series, hovering around an average of 68 to 70 percent. Most longtime fans of the series agree, though, that Goblet of Fire was a clear drop-off from the first games that came before it. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix restored the open-world exploration from the original three games and made some of the best attempts to please fans of the series, even going as far to involve a fan council to assist during the development process. As part of the game's open world... That's crazy, a fan council? Bring fans in, ask them what they want in the game, and then just do that? Can you imagine that? That's pretty cool. World nature, players could earn discovery points as they made their way through Hogwarts and use spells to interact with objects. Environmental spells included Accio, Depulso, Wingardium Leviosa, Incendio, Reparo, and Reducto. Wizard Duels also made a return, with the finale even putting players in the shoes of Albus Dumbledore for his epic duel against Lord Voldemort and the Department of Mysteries. For much of the game, however, players only control Harry, which was a departure from the pre- It's a little less badass than the, uh, the film. I'll give him that. ...previous two entries that had emphasized teamwork of the main trio. And speaking of Dumbledore, Dumbledore's army is also featured prominently throughout the game. Combat spells include Stupefy, Expelliarmus, Protego, Rictum Simpra, Levacorpus, Patrificus Totalis, and Expecto Patronum. Author J.K. Rowling also played a more prominent role in the development, even suggesting different characters for certain missions based on their personality within the Wizarding World. She also helped with rules for the various Wizarding World minigames that appeared, like Gobstones and Exploding Snap. With the advancements in video game technology, they were even able to scan faces of certain characters from the movie cast, like Rupert Grint and Ivana Lynch. The layout and appearance of Hogwarts was also based on the movie version of the castle. EA UK developed the game for PC, Mac, PS2, PS3, Xbox, and the Nintendo Wii, which proved to be the most popular version thanks in large part to the Wii Remote wand controls. It also didn't hurt that the Nintendo Wii was an insanely big seller. While the overall feel and lore of the game proved to be close to the source material, maybe more so than any Harry Potter game before it, the gameplay itself left much to be desired. The PC, PS3, and 360 versions certainly had the best graphics, but the Wii version was the most well-received among critics. Despite the improvements in fan involvement, however, many reviewers felt the gameplay was too easy and repetitive, which resulted in most scores falling below 70% pretty much across all platforms. The DS and GBA versions, which were developed by Visual Impact, scored poorly as well, as did the PSP version, which was developed by Rebellion Developments. And for the first time in the series, a mobile version was released by EA Mobile. Somewhat surprisingly, these Java games actually looked incredible for their time, with particularly oh, wow. strong lighting effects. They also featured wizard duels, flights with Hedwig, and plenty of stealth sequences throughout Hogwarts. All things considered, yeah, many felt this to be an incredibly solid attempt at making a mobile game worthy of the Harry Potter name. And that wasn't the only mobile Harry Potter game released in 2007. EA Mobile also released Harry Potter Mastering Magic for mobile phones. 
Mobile games were certainly still well, in their infancy awesome. in 2007, <laughs> which is probably why Mastering Magic was simply a collection of mm. mini-games. Eight, to be exact. That being said, the games themselves weren't half bad and featured classes from the wizarding world such as divination, care of magical creatures, and herbology. Unfortunately, the game suffered from the same as many games in the series by being too repetitive and too easy. Once the lessons were completed, players would take their ordinary wizarding level exam, which did help to boost the challenge somewhat. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince released in 2009, and fans were hopeful the series would continue moving in a positive direction after the changes that were made for Order of the Phoenix. Free-roaming Hogwarts, Quidditch, and Wizard Duels all made a return, however many found the gameplay repetitive yet again. You would primarily control Harry, although there are segments featuring Ron and Jenny as playable characters as well. Many of the spells from the previous game returned, but no new ones were added. The Wii version utilized the Wii Remote once again for spell casting and also added Wii Remote functionality to brewing potions. Given the storyline of Half-Blood Prince, it only made sense for potions to be featured more prominently, and that's certainly the case across all versions of the game. There are numerous potion brewing segments, including one with Felix Felicis. The production value continued to increase as characters looked more like their movie counterparts than ever before thanks to advancements of console hardware at the time. Many of the movie voice actors also returned, including Rupert Grint as Ron, Bonnie Wright as Jenny, Tom Felton as Draco, and plenty of others. Unfortunately, the animations were rough and at times bad enough to actually pull you out of the experience. And unfortunately, the entire game could be completed in roughly three and a half hours. Overall, Half-Blood Prince didn't innovate enough to see much critical success, as most reviewers scored it slightly lower than its predecessors. The Nintendo DS version used stylus controls and wasn't nearly as well received by reviewers, earning a 4.4 out of 10 from IGN. The PSP version was scored similar to the DS version. The mobile game once again proved to be a pleasant surprise, like Order of the Phoenix before it. The visual presentation was top-notch with detailed character sprites and high-quality animation. Most of the gameplay involved basic fetch quests where characters needed help finding items within Hogwarts. Then players were tasked with moving those items from one place to another. Wizard duels helped to break up the fetch quests, but while potions and Quidditch were featured so prominently in the console version, they don't appear at all in the mobile version. Harry Potter Spells was another attempt at capital- iPod Touch! Dude, I... So I loved my iPod Touch. I played in chess tournaments for like a year and a half to save up enough winnings to get an iPod Touch. And when I finally did, I was so proud of it. I felt like a million bucks. I was so cool. And then, you know, my older siblings just got like gifted it for Christmas, like shortly after. So I was like, why did I save up all that money if it was just going to be for Christmas? And my parents were like, well, it's because... I mean, you have one and they won't stop talking about how you have one and it's not fair. So we just wanted to equalize everything. I'm like, yeah, but I saved up for this. Like I did the work for it. Why? Like now they get to just skip that. That doesn't seem right. Well, life's not fair. Okay, mommy, dearest. <laughs> I'm telling all these stories that make my childhood sound terrible. I had a wonderful childhood for the record. I, I'm not like a... A jilted child. I, I don't think that at all. Um, <laughs> but there were some things in my childhood where I'm like, yeah, that was that was weird. That wasn't super cool. I only had the shuffle. I did get the shuffle for Christmas back in like 2006 or seven. Um, and we thought we were so cool. Oh, baby. I was so cool with that thing. Uh, the iPod touch I didn't get for a few years after that. And I saved up a long time for it. Um, and felt so cool with that thing. Oh, baby. I, I was unstoppable. It was when they still had the super silvery, shiny back to them. And I think it was like a three inch or a three and a half inch display. It was tiny, tiny. Capitalizing on the rapidly growing mobile games market. And this one was all about transforming your iOS device into a wand. After choosing a wand and getting sorted, which was actually random, surprisingly, you would start to learn the game's 14 different spells. Spells were cast through a series of different hand gestures. Once all 14 were mastered, players could move on to wizard duels, either against a computer-controlled player or a friend with another iOS device and a copy of the game. In 2010, it's hard to believe that nearly a decade had passed since the Chamber of Secrets LEGO Creator game, but WB and LEGO partnered up once again for LEGO Harry Potter Years 1 through 4. 
and this proved to be one of the standout games of the series, and still beloved by fans today. The LEGO formula for video games was already well established by 2010, and that formula lent itself perfectly to the Harry Potter franchise. The game's focus on collecting, exploring, solving puzzles, and overall sense of humor proved to be a huge hit with fans. Spellcasting was also made very simple through the use of a spell wheel. Given that the game covers the first four years of Harry's time at Hogwarts, it's no surprise that it's packed with content and unlockables, which include 167 characters. This certainly- Nikki and I started going through that, and I don't think it's bad, but it's... And I don't think it's aged super well. But maybe it's just that I'm spoiled by some of the later, um, like, Lego games. But I felt like it was overly complicated in a few parts, and, uh, you know, it's just a little clunky. But I get why people people like it. You okay, buddy? I'll, I'll make it. I'll be fine. It's coming together. You see this? See this? They also had me install a little turbine. So this thing is going to rotate and be the engine that uh, spins all the way through. And so the propeller will actually turn and it'll start right here where the, uh, the engine would be, which is kind of cool. It's a neat touch. Um, years five through seven is way better. I need to get to that then. Cause I think we're on like year three or four or something. We played it a little bit on the, I think PS five, I think is where we were playing it. I would not try floating it. No, I would not silence. No, <laughs> sure wouldn't. Uh, I tried to play it after Star Wars and wasn't nearly as fun. Yeah. Will you sink it in the Atlantic Ocean when it's all built? It's only right. If somebody, like, let me sail out to the location of the Titanic, I would send this down in honor of them. Probably would be considered insensitive, though, so we probably won't do that, but still. Double Eleven would later port the game to PS4, Xbox One, and the Nintendo Switch. The console version was overwhelmingly one of the best-reviewed Harry Potter games of the entire franchise with a Metacritic score of 80. Deathly Hallows Part 1 also released in 2010, and it too was a standout game in the series, but for all the wrong reasons. It did release alongside the movie, and in an effort to appeal to its aging core audience, it completely angle. altered the style of its flagship Harry Potter movie tie-in game. Deathly Hallows Part 1 changed the Harry Potter formula from an action-adventure with a focus on exploration and puzzle solving into a third-person shooter. The game heavily relied on a cover system, clearly inspired by the likes of shooter titles like Cures of War. The game even emphasized landing headshots and upgrading to stronger spells. There was no free roaming, no Quidditch, and sadly, no Hogwarts. Although the latter is a result of the book and movie storyline which took the trio out of their usual setting as the fight against Voldemort entered its final chapter. Instead, players fight numerous Death Eaters, Snatchers, Giant Spiders, Dragons, Doxies, Whomping Willows, and Dementors. What I was gonna say, before I screwed that up, is that this looks just like what they did with Resident Evil 8. They're like, oh, suspense thriller? Suspense horror game? No, no, no. We'll make it an action thriller shooter. And the last mission will just be basically a Call of Duty mission. Somewhat hilariously, the game uses the Elixir of Life as a healing item, which fans know was actually the potion Nicholas Flamel created with the Sorcerer's Stone to extend his life. The decision to go more action-oriented with Deathly Hallows was certainly understandable, however its execution failed due to a messy narrative style and the imprecise gameplay mechanics. Side missions often served no purpose other than to extend the gameplay length, and they completely broke up the storyline that players actually wanted to know about. There were stealth sections along the way which tried to break up the action, but unfortunately, both fans and critics alike are nearly unanimous in their disdain for Deathly Hallows Part 1, and Part 2 for that matter. The review scores across the board were the lowest of the series, with a Metacritic score of 37 out of 100 for the PC version. The Nintendo DS version was once again completely different and focused primarily on puzzle gameplay. As a result, it did see slightly more favorable review scores. The mobile version of the game proved to be another quality title, once again complete with outstanding visuals and a strategic combat system. Pocket Gamer gave it a silver award and noted, quote, The brilliant atmosphere, challenging combat, and superb storytelling are a magical recipe that any potions master would be proud of, close quote. And although it wasn't a traditional video game per se, Screen Life Games also published a mobile version of the popular Scenic game for iOS in 2010. 
The game featured HD clips from the first six movies and included a number of mini-games to test players' memory. In 2011, EA released what should have been an epic conclusion to the series that built upon all the titles that came before. To their credit, EA did hear the complaints on Part 1 and certainly attempted to remedy that with Part 2. But unfortunately, the result was another disappointing entry in the Harry Potter series. On the positive side, EA attempted to tell the story in a linear fashion that followed the movie more closely than Part 1 by not including those seemingly random, unnecessary side missions, and went back to a spellcasting system that mapped spells to the face buttons. They also added sequences with more playable characters in an attempt to capture the collective efforts of wizards fighting on Harry's side throughout the series and in the Battle of Hogwarts. Okay. Playable characters included Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, Neville, and even Seamus, Professor McGonagall, and Molly Weasley. Unfortunately, the overall gameplay and progression once again fire. suffered with boring level designs and wave after wave of Death Eaters to fight. The game also proved to be another short experience that could be beaten in around three hours. All in all, it was a disappointing... <laughs> it's boring, repetitive, bloated, and still only three hours long. <laughs> ...conclusion, even by the media... Yawn, good to see ya! We'll be wrapping up soon, don't worry. Booker standards of the Much movie love, have a great weekend. ...that came before it. This time round, even the mobile version was somewhat of a disappointment. Gameloft handled development rather than EA Mobile, and the game suffered as a result of this change. The graphics and animations were praised yet again, but the gameplay fell flat. Pocket Gamer said, quote, But when it comes to play itself, and the beguiling plot that rests heavy upon it, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 is neither engaging enough to mop up those with a casual interest, or active enough to serve those first in the queue at the flicks. Close quote. Fortunately for Harry Potter fans, Deathly Hallows Part 2 wasn't the only Potter video game to release in 2011. Traveler's Tales was back with the sequel to its first LEGO Harry Potter game. LEGO Harry Potter years 5 through 7 covered the events from Order of the Phoenix all the way to the series conclusion in Deathly Hallows. The game once again delivered the classic LEGO formula with two-player co-op, humor, fun yet simple mechanics, and a plethora of extras to unlock. Although some scenes are changed from the books and movies, often for comedic effect, the LEGO games did a great job at including the most iconic moments throughout Harry's final years at Hogwarts, including the battle at the Department of Mysteries, Dumbledore and Harry's fight against Inferi in the cave, and of course, Harry's final confrontation with Voldemort himself. Like years 1 through 4, LEGO Harry Potter years 5 through 7 remains one of the best-reviewed Potter games to date, with aggregate scores in the high 70s to low 80s depending on the platform. The this DS game, and PSP the gameplay is giving me a headache. <laughs> versions were both scaled-back versions of the console. It reminds me, when you're free to watch uh, Last of Us Watch Party, we have 8 to 20 p.m. or 18 to 20 color out of time um okay so like 6 to, to 8 p.m mm. best days are probably like thursday probably i'd say um yeah i'd say thursday games as a result, they didn't review as well, but most still found them to be enjoyable. Following the release of Deathly Hallows Part 2 and Lego Harry Potter Years 5 through 7... I did not see that uh, Whisper of Shadows. I did not see that. Um, ideally, I'd say 8 p.m., so 20 or 2,000 hours, um, because Lockie goes to bed at 7.30 usually, so that would be ideal if it would be after he goes to bed. In 2011... The franchise entered a new era for the series, as no other books or movies were on the horizon. In 2012, WB released what can best be described as experimental titles, heavy on gimmicks with Harry Potter for the Microsoft Connect, Wonderbook Book of Spells for the PlayStation 3, and then Wonderbook Book of Potions, also for PS3. Harry Potter Connect was an exclusive title for the Xbox 360 and unsurprisingly required the Connect accessory. Spells were performed with physical gestures and verbal incantations. This game was clearly geared toward a younger audience considering its actively tiring controls and short overall length. Book of Spells seemed to fare a little bit better with critics. The title actually came about as a result of a partnership between J.K. Rowling's Pottermore website and Sony Computer Entertainment. The game was developed by Sony's London studio and even gave users the option to link the game to their Pottermore accounts which would then in turn match the player's wand and Hogwarts house from their Pottermore account. 
As far as the actual gameplay, Book of Spells was an augmented reality experience that was mm. exclusive to PlayStation and took advantage of the iToy and PlayStation Move accessories. Like the Wii Remote before it, the Move controller was a natural fit to simulate wand motions. Through augmented reality with the iToy, the Move controller itself appears as a wand on the TV screen. The title, Book of Spells, is actually inspired by the textbook written by Miranda Goshawk in the series. In what is seemingly a common theme for many of the Harry Potter games, the overall experience ended up being rather short and not worth the price of a full-fledged release. Hmm. Critics did praise the actual mechanics of the game and its clever use of the PlayStation Move controller. Wonderbook Book of Potions released... Uh, what I find interesting is just how many of these things show... Brought to you by J.K. Rowling. Like, I just find that interesting because now they do not mention that. <laughs> it can just go to show you how much somebody's um, reputation can change and how quickly that can happen. ...in 2013 as a follow-up and featured nearly identical gameplay, but with more of a focus on brewing potions rather than casting spells. J.K. Rowling created a completely new character, Zygmunt Budge, who guided players in their potion making throughout the game. I am Zygmunt Budge. I discovered the properties of hundreds of secret plants and creatures. Budge attended Hogwarts at some point between the years of 1501 and 1594, but his house is unknown. In the foreword of Book of Potions, Budge claims to have invented many of the Wizarding World's most powerful potions. As far as critical reception, Book of Potions went by largely unnoticed to reviewers. It actually only received one critical review score on Metacritic. The Daily Telegraph's Andy Robertson published one of the few reviews for the game and gave it an overall positive review. After Book of Potions in 2013, the series went quiet for a long stretch. Even though there weren't any new books or movies, it's somewhat surprising to see that the series lay dormant for so long. In 2016, though, that changed as WB released a brand new film set in the Wizarding World. Brought to you by nothing to do with J.K. Rowling, we promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how they deal with it now. Um, yeah, you want to be a part of the day one chaos? It will be insane. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, a prequel to the events of Harry Potter. Somewhat surprisingly, WB did not create a major video game for the release of Fantastic Beasts. They did, however, release a new mobile game for Android and iOS. Fantastic Beasts, Cases from the Wizarding World. WB Games San Francisco partnered with developer Mediatonic to create a single-player, hidden object-style game where players controlled a member of the Beast Division in the Department for Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. The game took players through familiar locations such as Hogsmeade, the Leaky Cauldron, and Diagon Alley. There were 14 different cases for players to solve, which always involved uncovering a hidden magical beast causing some sort of unexplained happenings around it. Players would find hidden objects, cast spells, brew potions, and identify beasts to crack the case. Unfortunately, the game was officially shut down in January of 2020. From 2018 through 2021, WB only released a handful of mobile titles for the Harry Potter franchise, including Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery in 2018. It's still Harry crazy Potter to me that, like, the films have been over for a decade, and they're like, yeah, and they only released a handful of titles. Like, that's still crazy to me. That's wild. ...narrative-based role-playing game developed by Jam City under licensing from Port Key Rocky, go get some sleep. Place after Harry Have Potter's a good weekend. Birth, ...but before his enrollment at Hogwarts. With this timeline, many characters fans know from the series, such as Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Snape, make an appearance here. Players will also meet and work alongside Bill Weasley, who's a student at Hogwarts at the same time as the player. All of the elements you'd expect are here, such as learning spells, brewing potions, and playing Quidditch. The game even covers a full seven years at Hogwarts, and the choices you make along the way impact certain story elements and your relationship with other characters. Unfortunately, while the game is free, it's riddled with microtransactions and incredibly frustrating pay-to-win mechanics. In fact, the prices were so egregious that fan backlash led to a price cut on many of these microtransactions. Both reviewers and fans alike have criticized the pay structure of the game, and many specifically noted an early scene that immediately depletes your energy meter and then requires you to either wait half an hour for the energy to replenish, or pay real-world money to instantly refill the energy meter. Even with these criticisms, the game grossed $55 million in revenue by <coughs> August 2018, and more than 100 million by March of 2019. Yeah, you've never heard of this game, and it made 100 million dollars. 
That is the power of, for one, mobile games, and two, the Harry Potter franchise. Like, the franchise is still gigantic, even with people trying to cancel everyone else for enjoying it. And, um, you know, we, we always say, like, why do they keep doing this? We rage every time that they do microtransaction stuff in these games. What, when will they learn? It's like, no, they learned that it works because tons of people still pay it. Isn't the Dark Arts pack you can technically buy later or buy later technically a microtransaction? I mean, a lot of people say no. A lot of the, the Harry Potter fanboys I've talked to have said no. Um, I would say it's not a full transaction. It's not an expansion. It's like a smaller transaction you can make. Not a full transaction for like a game, not big enough to be an expansion. So it's like a, a very small transaction, a mini transaction, a micro transaction. <laughs> so, so I would call it a micro transaction, but a lot of people are trying to play on the technicalities because when people hear micro transaction, they think like pay two, like a buck 99 for this thing. And so they don't think of it. They think of it as a, an extra piece of DLC or content or something. But I'm like, that. I mean, it's a microtransaction. That's it, what it is. Um, so I would say so. But the developers are saying no microtransactions. They're classifying it as like an additional piece of downloadable content. And if that's the only thing that's downloadable content uh, at launch, I you know what? That's not that bad. I'll give them that. Uh, I think eventually they'll have DLC and expansions and stuff. They'll bring in more cosmetics you can buy. And, you know, they'll capitalize on this. But um I would say that it's, yeah, nano transactions. Yeah, I, I would classify it as micro, but a lot of people don't. At the time of this recording, Hogwarts Mystery is still being supported with new updates. Harry Potter Wizards Unite is a mobile title developed and published by Niantic under licensing from Portkey Games. And yes, it's the very same Niantic who created the incredibly popular Pokemon Go. Like Pokemon Go, the gameplay is based around augmented reality and location-based gameplay. Players needed to physically visit real-world locations and use their mobile device to cast spells, discover artifacts, and meet up with familiar characters and fantastic beasts from the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Similar to most Potter games before it, you'll choose your wand and house at the start of the game, but in this one, you'll also need to pick a profession. You can be a professor, auror, or magizoologist. By May of 2021, the title had been downloaded 20 million times and had a total revenue of 37 million. Unfortunately, the game fell short of expectations, and in November of 2021, they announced plans to remove the game from all app stores in December and then fully shut down the game in January of 2022. Harry Potter puzzles and... I think what it was is it launched like right around the time people were still in lockdowns and people weren't going out anywhere near, near as much, so it was never going to do as well as Pokemon Go. I mean, and I downloaded it, I tried it, and like where I live in Colorado... There's nothing like Pokemon Go you can't play because there's just nothing around here because um, they basically populate based on population density. So like the more people are there, the more items there are for you to collect. So if you live somewhere that's a little more remote, there's just nothing. And so there's nothing to collect or get. And with this game, it was the same kind of thing. So I was like not going out very often, downloaded it, and I caught like two or three th creatures. And I was like, okay, well. This was fun, and so I, I just got rid of it. Spells is yet another Harry Potter mobile game, although this one was developed by the mobile gaming giant Zynga and published by Port Geek Games in September of 2020. It was released on Android, iOS, Kindle, and Facebook. At its core, Puzzles and Spells is a match three puzzle game that includes familiar Wizarding World locations like Diagon Alley and Hogwarts, among others. It puts a spin on the classic match three formula by having various Harry Potter spells and items that you can earn along the way to help you clear the puzzles. The game is free to play, but does feature some microtransactions. At the time of this video recording, it has more than 134,000 ratings on iOS with an impressive 4.8 out of 5 average score. It's also still being actively supported by Zynga with frequent updates and a story that spans across multiple books. Harry Potter Magic Awakened is a Wizarding World mobile game that just recently had its official launch, but only in select territories. It's an RPG card game for PC, Android, and iOS. 
and it's set 10 years after Harry Potter's victory over Voldemort in the Battle of Hogwarts. It was first announced back in October of 2019 and is being developed by NetEase and published by WB under the Portkey Games label. With this game taking place so close to the original series, there are actually quite a few familiar faces that players will interact with throughout the game. The main character's journey starts similar to Harry's when the half-giant Rubius Hagrid shows up to deliver a letter of acceptance to a young Muggleborn. Hagrid Doesn't teaches look about the Wizarding World and joins them on their first trip to Diagon Alley. The story really kicks off at the sorting ceremony when a fellow first year, Ivy Warrington, goes missing. Players will get to choose their Hogwarts house, attend classes, explore the castle, and even join the dueling club. Most of the action and spellcasting will be centered on the game's card-based combat system. The game has impressed so far, but a large portion of the Harry Potter fanbase is still awaiting its release in more territories. And so, that brings us to the modern day, with one Harry Potter game looming on the horizon and set to release in 2022. That's right, it's Hogwarts Legacy. That common bond we share is the legacy of Hogwarts. With the incredible success of the franchise over the years, it shouldn't come as a shock to anyone that even more Harry Potter games are in development to this day. At the time of this video recording, Hogwarts Legacy is in development at Avalanche Software with plans to publish under the Portkey Games label. Players will create their own witch or wizard and step into a late 1800s wizarding world long before Harry defeats Voldemort at the Battle of Hogwarts. The game is an open world action RPG and given the incredible success of the genre in recent years, Fans are hopeful this could finally be the Harry Potter game to buck the trend of being merely acceptable and hopefully moving up to exceeding expectations, or possibly even outstanding. Even with the late 1800s timing, players will travel to familiar locations such as the Forbidden Forest and Hogsmeade Village. Magical creatures will feature prominently and a number of them have already been confirmed, including centaurs, goblins, graphorns, mooncalves, spiders, trolls, and hippogriffs. Despite the lengthy history of video games set in the wizarding world, longtime fans of the series are still holding out hope for a game that can fully capture the magic of the rich and vibrant world fans fell in love with so many years ago. Today, many players look- I mean, we'll see. Hopefully he does live up to it. Yeah, this game looks good. What's it called again? I, I, I think personally, if I had to put money on it, I think Hogwarts Legacy probably comes out and is going to sit at like mid to high 80s. That's what I would expect. Um, I don't think it's going to be like breathtakingly amazing. I think like the story will be serviceable. I think... The combat's probably going to be robust enough. I would expect them to lean heavily into some, like, really repetitious combat with, like, you know, the typical battle arenas. You move to this room, you get jumped. Move to the next room, you get jumped. That kind of thing. Because most inexperienced open-world action RPG-style developers uh, tend to rely on, a lot on that type of thing. But um, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be interesting to see how they pull it off. It's going to be too short. It's probably going to be very, very... I would guess that it's probably pretty repetitive, but I don't know if it'll be short. He took my thing! <laughs>